stand if you don't want Perfect. to. <laughs> this is a this is com the comfortable one. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Ashley Feynman. I'm a junior here at Peru, and I'm majoring in English, minoring in journalism. So I read Young Nathan, which was Brown's first published novel from 1949. It was a historical fiction tale of a uh, Revolutionary War hero, Nathan Hale, and so it kind of discusses his life from age 13 to 21 where he died in the war and Brown really goes through different events and different people that he meets who really influence his decision to join the war and kind of show his courage and bravery and so one of those people are his father who is a very conservative religious figure um, and looking at it from a 21st century point of view that was pretty kind of threatening and um, not great, but his father um, instilled a lot of ideals of hard work and um, religion, courage, and bravery in, uh, in Nathan, so that carried over throughout his life. Um, he goes to Yale at age 14, like the real life Nathan did. He joins the Linomian Society, which is a real society in Yale. It was founded in 1753 and it's a literary and debating society. So the passage that I chose to read from here was one of the debates that the society held where Nathan led it and started the conversation. So, Brother Linonians, Nathan began, the topic for discussion this evening is what thing in the world is most delightful to man? Let us first examine the meaning of the word delightful. The dictionary defines it as that which brings extreme satisfaction, joy, or great pleasure a high degree of gratification of mind or sense. Thus we see that delightful means much more than pleasurable, that it refers to something deeper, more worthwhile, more lasting, which gives true soul satisfaction. I believe the most satisfactory thing in the world to man is performing brave and virtuous deeds. Immediately a discordant chorus of approval and dissent broke out. Yes, no, he's right. Not if by man you mean the genus homo. Nathan rapped for order and continued, only through doing virtuous acts can a man get any real and lasting satisfaction. At the close of life, no man would say that the momentary pleasures of the senses had given him a great satisfaction in life, but that brave deeds done in a noble cause had brought him the truest of life. I am speaking of mankind in general. Some men, lacking the insight to see truly and to evaluate correctly, may never experience the delight of noble action. But man in general, the genus homo, having in him the spark of God, will find brave and virtuous deeds the most satisfying. So I think that passage really shows Nathan's principles and philosophies that he takes with him uh, when he goes to teach. And then he hears about the Boston Tea Party and the first shots at Lexington and Concord. And that's what drives him to quit teaching and to join the armed forces that have gotten together in the colonies. And so he does end up dying, sort of, but um, much like the real Nathan, um, he takes a mis mission from General Washington to spy, go over enemy lines, and try to get information. But uh, he is caught and then hanged for being a spy. But I really liked the novel. Um, it's a young adult book uh, from the late 1940s. I um, thought it was pretty good. And um, I like Brown's style. <coughs> Historical fiction is not something that I've really dove into, but um, it was a good start. And I liked Nathan Hale's story. It was interesting, exciting to read. And you know, she adds a bunch of different kind of flavors in there, some romance and stuff like that. So yeah, that was my book. Perfect. I read The Prairie Teacher which is the story of the 18-year-old Trudy Martin, and she is a woman that um, wanted to go to New York City and pursue her dreams of acting and singing. But unfortunately, she had polio when she was younger, and so she has a limp, and uh, she's not really able to pursue her dreams. So as a last resort, she ends up getting her teaching degree and going to teach in the Sandhills, uh, which she was not very excited about. She pretty much hated it and she went into it very upset and everything she saw in the Sand Hills was upsetting to her and um, through these stories she has to evolve as a person and as a teacher. Um, she ends up dealing with this child named Otto who was a troubled child in her class and that's kind of what ends up uh, motivating her as a teacher because she 
thinks that if she can turn him around, she uh, her year teaching will have been worth it. So a lot of stories focusing on her trying to turn him around. And then there is also an element of romance. Um, she ends up meeting a mysterious cowboy named Chuck Wainwright, <laughs> um, who is just very quiet and reserved and very, very different from anyone that she had known before. And um, despite the fact that she's convinced she's not going to stay teaching or stay in this sand hill town very long, she ends up falling for him and um, loving the sand hills and loving teaching. And I really, really liked getting to um, compare what it was like for her as a teacher at the time in this book and what it's like for current teachers. For example, on her first day of classes, she goes in with no plan. She just <laughs> went for it. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, this will be fine. And everything goes wrong. <laughs> and I'm currently working on my first day of school plan <laughs> that's um, pretty thorough. And she just goes in with nothing. And it really doesn't work out for her. So the passage that I'm reading is um, after her first day and kind of her little sweet moment at the end where she starts to maybe for the first time realize that teaching could be a good thing. And background, there was a little girl who wet her pants. Um, Trudy never knew how she got through the first day of school. She didn't get any of the things done that she had planned to do, but somehow she managed to find the janitor to clean up the puddle. Somehow she managed to comfort the little disgraced one. Somehow she managed to take care of Cheetah, to get rid of Mrs. Newton, and to get David into a seat in the first grade row. And through it all, somehow she managed to keep an eye on Otto. When at long last, it was 3.30, and she lined the children up for dismissal. She was exhausted, and her temples throbbed as if a trip hammer were pounding inside her head. A hot wind had blown all day, and it had been impossible to shut it out, for with the windows closed, the room became suffocating. The first graders were the last in line, and as Trudy stood in the doorway watching the second and third graders file down the hall, there was a tug at her skirt. She looked down to see Cheetah pulling up her thin arms. Trudy bent down to them, and for an instant they clung tight around her neck, and she felt a wet kiss on her cheek. When Cheetah had released her, she was caught by David, and then by the next child, and the next, until every first grader in the room had kissed her goodnight. When the last one had gone, she sat weakly at her desk. Her emotions were mixed. Relief was utmost relief. Relief was uppermost. Relief that the first day was over, but there was a small portion of triumph mixed in. She thought she hadn't managed too badly, all things considered. And there was a surprising feeling of warmth induced by the damp little arms and slobbery kisses of her first graders, even though she sat wiping her face vigorously with her handkerchief. So, I just really like that passage because even though she went in with no plan and she was really upset to be there, instead of in New York City, she still had that special moment with the kids that was the first little indication that maybe teaching was a good thing and maybe it would be something that she would end up loving, which she does. Um, and then I, there's archive material in the library and what uh, the archive material associated with my book are these handwritten notes that are basically impossible to read, but you can pick out some words and I thought it was interesting because even though I couldn't read a lot of it, it was preliminary notes on the characters and the plot, and I could pull out just enough where it is pretty much a summary of the book. Um, one of the big things I could pull out said, meets Sandhill Boy, unsophisticated, truly gentle person, which describes Chuck, her moody little cowboy that she ends up calling for, and then wanted to be a TV performer and is taking teaching only as a substitute because of the handicap of her limp, which again is pretty much a summary. And then the thing I... Um, thought was most interesting, especially because um, Marion Marsh Brown was a teacher, so I assume this comes from her personal life. It says her big challenge hyphen to teach children freedom. Um, so even though in the book Trudy goes through all kinds of trouble, she has her limp and she's got to deal with her feelings for Chuck and she gets pneumonia and almost dies, she breaks her ankle, children almost drown on her watch, it's a very dramatic book. <laughs> but even though she goes through all of those hardships, still the whole overarching theme was that she wanted to teach her children freedom and she wanted to help her children grow as young individuals. So I really, really liked that aspect of it from an education major's point of view. Yeah, first graders. Yeah, it was first graders. First, second, and third. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Okay, um, my name is Taylor Finke and I am a major in English education with a minor in art education. And the book I read was called The Silent Storm. And The Silent Storm was published in 1963 and the story focuses on Annie Sullivan who is, she's pretty much considered a teacher to Helen Keller. And so the book first opens up when Annie has just graduated from school and she's kind of looking for a job and then she gets a letter from Captain Keller and he's asking her to come down to Alabama to teach Helen because he can't really find anyone to help her. Mm -hmm. And so she's really kind of like conflicted at first. She's like, should I go? Should I not go? And then she ends up going and on the train ride down, Marian Marsh Brown offers a lot of flashbacks to Annie and it kind of develops her character more because we learn that she was orphaned as a child and then her and her brother were sent off to an orphanage and then soon after there her brother died and she was very behind in school and she saw all the kids in the orphanage reading, writing and she's like I want to go to school, I want to go to school and so um, one of the head people in the orphanage got her to Perkins which was a school for the blind because Annie suffered um, an eye disease that made it hard for her to see at times and so she went to Perkins and then she was so far behind a lot of the other kids that she was put in like first grade classes and she was very disruptive and she had uh, like issues with the teachers and everything and so then they put her in the older classes and she kind of her teacher worked with her one-on-one -on -one to like catch her up with everyone and then she eventually started to teach some history classes it said in the book to um, some of the other students that needed help and eventually she would graduate from Perkins and she would graduate as valedictorian and then that kind of ends Annie's flashbacks and it brings us up to date in the story and then Annie arrives in Alabama and she when she first get there when she first gets there she's like I don't want to do this I want to go home and then like on the second day she goes down and she's at breakfast and she's fine like okay I'm gonna have a plan of attack and then she what the thing that stuck out with me is she physically would take Helen's hand and she would like do the motion of eating or she would like show her what to do and that's how she got through with her first and then eventually she would start to write letters in her hand or write words in her hand for them to communicate. And the, per the book pretty much just carries Annie's life through Helen's life and as she gets older. And my favorite part in the book is the end of the book when Helen graduates from college and that's the passage of the read. As the graduation exercises proceeded, Anna realized that her nervousness had left her. She was very glad that no special fuss was made over Helen's graduation. She liked it this way. The name of Helen Adams Keller was listed on the fourth page of the Radcliffe Commencement Program, alphabetized with the order of Camlades. The very normalcy of all this made it even more clear that Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan had reached their goal. Helen had her sheepskin in one hand. Taking her hand in hers, Annie said, Come, John is waiting for us. The silent storm within her at last was stilled. And I really like the last line of the book because all over her, over her life she had to worry about her brother and she had to worry about what she was going to do and she really struggled with things and then she, when she got to Helen she really was like internal conflict with am I doing this right, am I making an impact on this child and I can relate to that because like as a future teacher I want to be able to do what she did and get through with the children and affect them positively and overall I really enjoyed the story because of that. Okay, to finish this up, I'm Quentin Victor, an English major here at Peru, also political science minor. I'm a senior, so I'm going to be graduating in the May. So this is, I really like this project, just as like one last hurrah for me and Dr. Clemente, <laughs> who is holding the camera right now. <laughs> Anyways, I was assigned the book Marnie by Mary Marsh Brown. This is a novel she wrote in 1971. Interestingly, I think Marnie is basically her most personal novel in a way, in that it is basically retelling in a year of her childhood when she experienced like a great deal of change. Like she grew up on a Nebraska farm, and she undergone a lot of things. Like her father died, her her brother broke his leg, 
She broke her arm. Uh, she had to experience like the life and death of farm animals, which is kind of interesting in how it informs her. Her in that Marnie's character, she has a lot. She has kind of an obsession with life and death. Like she becomes very interested in basically the cycle of life and rebirth, and so it leads. And since this is basically Marion Marsh Brown in a sense. It felt kind of weird reading that, especially as I met her son, Paul Brown, because you get the sense that Mary Marsh Brown, as a kid, really wanted to become a parent. And so that, that's just a nice little meta tidbit of meeting her son. But anyways, uh, this book is also very different from the others in that I think it's rather episodic. It makes me think of something like Huckleberry Finn, except minus the racism and the actual adventure, because it's very much a coming-of-age story about quote, Marnie growing up and growing into her role in her family and stepping up. Another interesting thing she has to deal with is like a friend getting pregnant, and so yeah, we, we have to see her deal with things like boys, which is always fun when you're 14, right? <laughs> Anyways, I thought it was very... In There's a segment that I really liked in that she had just witnessed the birth of kittens that I will read. He was cutting across the yard from the orchard, but she had neither heard nor seen him till he spoke. Mother Gray just had kittens, Daddy. I watched one being bored. Hmm, he said, smiling at her. Suddenly all the hurt and misery she had felt since the night before was wiped away. Oh, Daddy, isn't it wonderful how we're born? He nodded. That's one of the nice things about living on a farm. You get to see the baby animals born and watch them grow. It's like, like a miracle, she said. He nodded again, patted her arm, and went on to the barn. Marty stood where he had left her, thinking about the tremendous thing called birth. Abruptly, her mind switched to thinking about her father. He didn't think she had done that awful thing yesterday. If he had, she wouldn't have felt so close to him just now. He would not have looked at her and spoken to her and touched her so gently. But all of this he had told her he knew she hadn't been involved in that... Th all this he told her he knew she hadn't been involved in that despicable trip. Basically, they did, did something where they replaced brownies with mud, which totally something you do to, to your parents. Like, <laughs> suddenly she realized that it must be hard for grown-ups to say things sometimes, as hard for them to ask for forgiveness, perhaps. As for her to tell Twist, her brother, she was sorry when she had done something to hurt him. The realization made her feel more a part of the grown-up world. She felt as though she had been let in on a secret. And so I think that's an interesting way to look at Marnie's development in that she is slowly transitioning to becoming an adult and wanting to go after the things she wants to do. Like, she wants to become a writer, so she sends, uh, she sends stories to the editor of a newspaper, and it doesn't get in, but her dad is always there to support her. And so, uh, yeah, it was a good read, and something that I think was even more interesting, in, in my opinion, was I intend to be a writer at some point, and so the, in the archives we have here at Peru like these manuscripts, basically the first draft of this book, and I can see from there how much different the first draft is in that like it's structurally different, and uh, just for a quick spoiler, which isn't much of a spoiler because it's advertised on the back of the book, her brother breaks his leg. That, in the final release, that happens halfway through the book. In the original, well, first draft, that happens in, I think, the first or second chapter. And so it makes sense to push that to the middle of the book, because then we can develop more of an attachment to Twist. But also, I think it's interesting in that the chapter ends the same way with Marnie making a promise that she will never be mean to her brother ever again, which no sibling can ever promise that. <laughs> and so I think it really works better to do that in the middle of the book 
in that we find we actually have an understanding of their relationship as childish as it, as it is. And that's also something I just really lo like about this book is just the dynamics of the family. Yeah, I, I, I'm a sucker for sibling dynamics. Which reminds me of the siblings in Ashley's book, which you better bring up once I'm done here. <laughs> but yeah, Marnie was an interesting read in how it basically portrayed a very personal episode in Marion Marsh Brown's life. I'm just curious about how much, how, how difficult it must have been to put her real life on page like that. Yeah. That, that, that's it. <laughs> Ashley, you talk about your thing now that you left out. <laughs> oh, the added bit of romance in my book that I skipped over, um, Nathan's dad remarries and his stepmom has a daughter who's the same age as Nathan. So it's his stepsister and he develops a thing for her. And she develops a thing back. Um, <laughs> so for late 1700s, maybe that was a thing that actually happened. <laughs> It was weird. <laughs> Working Frankenstein. <laughs> so I, I loved that out of the my talk earlier. <laughs> Tell us about uh, Helen Keller's first publication. Oh, uh, when Helen was, I think she was about ten at the time, but um, she wrote a story. She told Annie she wrote a story and she signed it to her, and then Annie took this story and it was really good, and so she published it in a magazine and. Um, when they, they take a trip back to Perkins to visit um, Annie's teachers and like for Helen to learn some new things and interact with children. And while there, she gets a letter that reveals that Helen had plagiarized this um, story that she wrote. And from then on, Annie had to like tell her, okay, this is what I'm telling you. And then she had to tell her, this is what I'm reading you. And so that was kind of like a big adjustment for Annie. And she kind of felt very guilty on her part because Helen didn't know any better. 